yeah, let's begin. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the Malaysia Cybersecurity Act 2024. I'm Rachel from LGMS, and I will be the, your host for tonight. We are delighted to have you join us tonight for what promises to be an enlightening and insightful discussion. Our esteemed speakers for the evening are none other than Mr. Fong, the Executive Chairman of LGMS, and guest speaker, Mr. Alex Lowe, Chair of PCOM Cybersecurity Chapter. Together, they will bring a wealth of cybersecurity and experience to shed light on this crucial legislation and its implications. So if at any point you have any questions during the session, feel free to drop a question in the Q&A box and we will address them along the way. Without further ado, I'll pass the time over to Mr. Alex. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Fong and uh, LGMS team for inviting PCOM to support this event today. It is very pertinent we address the development of, of the Cybersecurity Act 2024 as it will have a major impact on the industry, including national critical information infrastructure, which is NCII, and the security service providers. For those who do not know, we would like to give you a brief intro about PCOM. PCOM is the National Technology Association of Malaysia, presenting about 1,000 members across the entire spectrum of technology products and services. We have formed eight chapters to service our members better, including a cybersecurity chapter. The cybersecurity chapter represents almost 100 technology providers, including vendors and managed security service providers. In addition, we have a cybersecurity user group that brings together major IT users as well. We can play a role to voice the views of the industry to the government to ensure that policies by the government would have input from the industry. It is our role to highlight challenges faced by the industry in ad adhering to the government's regulation. This act is no different. We have had engagement sessions with the government on the act. And recently, we have also signed an MOU with NASA to increase the awareness of the act. The webinar today is a step in the right direction. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Fong and LGMS for taking the initiative. Looking forward to an even aging and interactive session. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much uh, for supporting and thank you, thank you to P big thank you to PCOM of uh, supporting industry events like this. I think uh, we are now approaching 100 attendees already, so uh, it's about time we stay kick started. And uh, this is going to be a very interesting topic, uh, I would say. I personally have, have hosted this event several times and uh, along the way, I've also been following the development of the, the, the act and the regulations. Uh, so tonight, what we are going to do is we're going to do our best to summarize the essence of the act up to the latest stage and to share with everybody uh, what are the watch out, what are the interesting points about the act and uh, where are the opportunities of investment and also uh, if anyone have any questions please feel free to ask questions and we are meant this session is more meant to be more interactive and uh, and have uh, open uh, it's an open platform uh, basically we we, are, we wanted to uh, have a platform where everyone can ask questions then we share feedbacks uh, because if this is going to be a one-way session I'm pretty confident that I can put everyone to sleep in, in less than 30 minutes time because we are talking about cybersecurity act it's not something it's going to be fun and uh, so we want to make it as interactive as possible so feel free to send your question in we do the best we do our best to answer your questions so um, okay Rachel do you have anything else to share uh, Mr. Fong you can go ahead okay I'm trying to share my slide here uh, I can't see my slide uh, um I don't have a share function. Can you enable? I don't have a sharing function here. Have you enabled sharing? Check that as a phone. Yeah. Um, not able to share or another way you can also share from your site if you have the slide oh, 
thing. I don't see the share function here. Being too secure is not a good thing as well. <laughs> so while you're working on this, uh, let me just share with everyone about this, uh, the, the latest development. Uh. So once the law has been enforced on the 26th of August, um, and before that, a few days before that, there were four regulations, in fact, five to be more exact, five regulations being published. Now these regulations, is, you can see it as extension of what the law uh, requires. To do so we are going to dive into these five or four uh the four main regulations namely are uh, those regulations that talk about compounder offenses regulations that talks about licensing of service providers uh, regulations to talk about the requirements of security assessment and the requirements the finally the requirements for incident response so these are the four topics we're going to dive in and these four topics is also going to give everyone a clearer clearer idea uh, what is required to be done, you know, as a license, uh, as a player, as an operator in the NCII, and also a licensed service provider. So while we are working on the slide, uh, do we have anything, any improvement, Ken? So I still can you see the slide, slide? Mister Fong? I can see the I slide. Share uh, wow. So sharing a screen, use your screen. Okay, fine. So okay. let's move on to the next next slide. Uh, all right. So these are these are the content of uh, today's webinar. We want to keep it short, like, as simple as possible, to keep it condensed as in as impact as possible, and then uh, we can spend some time doing Q and A. If anyone has any questions, would like to uh, get addressed. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, quick. Disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. This is something I want to clarify first. Uh, I'm still a cybersecurity practitioner. Uh, currently, I'm the executive chairman of LGMS Berhad. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, but my background is pretty much coming from uh, as a practitioner. So I have a background in uh, penetration testing, uh, digital forensic, computer crime investigations. I've co-authored a book called um, Certified Lead Forensic Examiner, for, examiner, examiner Program for PCB in the US. and. Uh, I'm still very passionate in cybersecurity industry, and uh, you probably have seen me, uh, you know, sharing some inf some uh, interest in cybersecurity over the media before. And uh, this again, today's session is not really um, my interpretation coming from legal perspective, but but my interpretation coming from a cybersecurity practitioner perspective, and also coming from from perspective of a business operator. And also today, we are very grateful to have Alex with us. Uh, maybe Alex, you can. Do a self intro. Hi, I guess I. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I am also actually started off as an engineer, but more towards to the Cisco and Microsoft, and after that, I've actually gone into the solution side of it, and uh, with the uh, dimension data, and then followed by in some of the MNC boutique like VMware and also Fortinet, Malaysia, and uh, and right now I'm actually with Nera. So I'm actually the secretary of PCOM, uh, uh, which is the office bearer. And also I'm the cybersecurity chapter chair for PCOM for the last three years. So I hold a master degree in uh, finance and also my bachelor in, I know uh, my master degree in MIS and my bachelor in finance. Thank you, Alex. And also thanks to Alex, uh, we have a quite, quite an active uh, chapter, uh, cybersecurity chapter under PCOM's uh, uh, so we also just had a cyber future of cybersecurity event uh, a few months back, and uh, I think it was a quick success. So um, about LGMS, this program was brought to you by LGMS. LGMS currently uh, we are currently perceived as the largest independent cybersecurity service provider in the country, uh, namely in the areas of penetration, penetration testing, security assessment, and computer crime investigation, digital forensic. We have a joint venture with Tooth Austria. Tooth Austria is one of the oldest certification body in the world, and our role in the joint venture is to provide security testing assessment uh, for the certification body. And right now, Tooth Austria, the cybersecurity test lab, is the only lab that is established outside of uh, European continent. And uh, the lab currently right now is in Subang. And uh, our focus is pretty uh, consistent over the years. And our focus is to provide independent, non-biased cybersecurity assessment to our, to our customer. And hence, uh, our major differentiation point is that we do not carry any third-party products. Uh, because we believe that as an independent service provider, we need to be neutral and we need to stay objective in order to provide the best of breach services to our customers. Uh, so let's dive into the Cybersecurity Act. Okay, I think this is the reason why everyone is here. 
Um, I'm going to skip some of these formal statements uh, because uh, I think you can you can probably read it from anywhere. So let's go into the more interesting part, which is this part. Now, this is the most, I would say, the most important part because it concerns everybody. Everyone will ask the same question. Uh, will I be affected by the Cybersecurity Act or not? Am I involved in this? Do I need to comply to the Act or not? So this is the part where everyone is asking this question. So as part of the Act, there are 11 sectors being named. 11 sectors uh, being uh, listed. Uh, these are considered the national critical information infrastructure sectors. Now, which are the sectors? I mean, for, for most of us, I think we are quite uh, quite uh, accepted that uh, banking and finances are uh, is, has been regulated for a long time. So this sector is naturally is national critical, sorry, excuse me, national critical information infrastructure sector. Um, of course, the government, um, national security, and, and something quite new and quite interesting that we see that was being listed as part of the NCII, including and not limited to water, sewerage and waste management, agriculture and plantation, right, trade industry economy, uh, and also healthcare services. Now, why I say it's quite interesting because these are what we call the non-conventional sector that when it comes to cybersecurity implementation. Uh, some of these sectors may have a very matured uh, but yet unregulated uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, situation where, for example, healthcare services, I believe most of the major healthcare operators today, like hospitals, major hospitals, pharmaceutical firms, uh, they are already using digital uh, technologies, they're using computers, they're using network, they are, many of them are, are interconnected. Uh, but then again, in Malaysia, we do not have a law, an act that mandates cybersecurity protection on these sectors, particularly healthcare. Now, uh, if you do a comparison, right, in the US, we have HIPAA, Health Insurance Accountability and Portability Act, HIPAA. In the US, it make, uh, the, the act make it very clear, if you are healthcare operators, you need to comply with this cybersecurity protection requirements, you need to comply to all the incident response requirements and you need to submit your you know, incident report, report to your authorities. So there are various steps for healthcare operators to, to follow. Now, this, when it, in the introduction of this 2024 Malaysia cybersecurity law, I'm quite uh, happy to see that healthcare services is now finally as is perceived under NCIA and also that they are governing framework that's going to govern the healthcare uh, industry. Because over the years, we have seen quite a number of healthcare uh, industry uh, targeted attacks on healthcare industry. I think if everyone here still remembers, Sing Health, Singapore Health Ministry uh, has suffered a very serious uh, cyber attacks and uh, even the president's health data, health record was leaked out. And uh, with this introduction of 20 to Malaysia cybersecurity, I think this is a very very smart move uh, by the government to include healthcare, because healthcare not just um, it doesn't just concern about personal data. Because a lot of the time we are we are talking about personal data, but then again, when it comes to cyber attacks, right, hackers may not necessarily interested in uh, in personal data. You just imagine that if you know hackers manage to disrupt the operation of a hospital, disrupt the operation of uh, let's say um, an operation room. Right, create create disruption, create downtime for let's say MRI machines, X-ray machine, or even you know at the operation table, you you cannot perform your surgery, and all because of you know hackers disrupting the the, the IoT devices, and these can cost human lives, and that's that's the reason why sometimes uh, when we talk about cyber attacks, uh, security incidents, right, a lot of our our friends just talk about data leak, you know data loss, and in fact it's more than that. So healthcare is a good good start, and uh, agriculture and plantation is also a good start. And uh, something that is not included in these eleven, which I think, which is quite necessarily necessarily to be included, is number one, hospitality hospitality industry. Now, hospitality industry may not be perceived as national critical information infrastructure, but nevertheless, the hospitality industry is also. It's also one of the industries that suffered the, the most frequent cyber attacks. You have probably seen news that hackers attacking uh, hotels, attacking uh, resorts, extracting credit card information, personal data, uh, and, and all of these incidents are still continue to happen. Uh, unfortunately, we also do not have any governing framework or even a law uh, to mandate the protection of, uh, of uh, critical infrastructure. We do have 
PTPA in Malaysia. But then again, we are talking about two different things. I mean, we start from protecting of, of the uh, infrastructure first, then talk, talk about, about the protection of data. And another industry I, which I think is quite important, uh, but unfortunately it was not uh, included in this national NCII is the retail industry. Uh, however, when we look at this NCI, there's an industry called trade industry and economy. I'm not sure whether retail industry is classified under this. And uh, in fact, there are some questions also uh, amongst our peers and our friends. And what exactly are those businesses that classify under, for example, information, communication digital? I think communication digital, we can refer relate to ISP, internet service providers, uh, telecommunication operators. But what about information provider, uh, cloud service provider, are they considered part of this? Uh, what about system integrators who are, you know, buying and selling uh, critical infrastructure assets to NCI operators, are they considered part of this? So there are still some questions floating around and hopefully uh, NAXA in along the way will give us a much better clarity. So these are the 11 sectors that we included. And also uh, we have seen NAXA also have, they have released uh, the recommended sector lead, the sector lead for each sector. So, uh, and also it's, it is pretty much aligned with what we are expecting. Uh, before that, when we run this seminar, this webinar with our uh, previous audience, uh, we were speculating that the sector lead most likely will be government agency. It could be a ministry or it could be a commission. And true enough, and uh, when we saw this list, and uh, it makes a lot of sense that the government, the ministries themselves, are the sector lead. So my hope is that because um, Malaysia, to be honest, Malaysia, we do not have the perfect record in in uh, protection of inf information security in the government sector. So I'm hope th hoping that with this extra responsibility given to the sector lead, right, and hoping that uh, the government will uh, lead by example by having much better cybersecurity posture uh, when you are a sector lead now. You know, when you're governing the entire sector, you you should be having a much better cybersecurity uh, and, and lead by example. So these are the these are the sector leads we have cl classified under. Uh, has been released by uh, uh, Naxa. So unsurprisingly, it's also the sector leads are coming from the ministries. So these are the four sub uh, subsidiary regulations that I would like to spend more time on. So after the Act, right, we have the Act, Act as a framework, as a foundation. The four regulations are being mentioned, uh, being released prior to the enforcement of the Act. These are the four regulations. Number one, start with the risk assessment, the requirement for risk assessment and audit. And then the second one talks about cybersecurity incident response. And the third one, compounding offenses. What are the list of offenses that uh, that's compoundable? And then finally, the licensing of cybersecurity service providers. So these are the four regulations that I think uh, for SMEs, for business owners, that should be aware uh, aware about. All right. Let's start with uh, first one by one. Compoundable offenses. Now there are a lot of. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, there were there are quite a number of compoundable offenses being mentioned in the Act. And uh, if you look at the figures, uh, we're not talking about 10,000, 50,000, we're talking about six figures. Of course, the fine is up to six figures, but to be exact, what are the actual number, we also do not know. Uh, compoundable offenses also carries a meaning that uh, you do not have to go to court, you know, to receive the, the uh, compoundable offenses. Um, so, and from from the interpre interpretation of the act, we, we also have an understanding that the chief executive uh, being appointed uh, uh, under the act has uh, has an absolute power to do a lot of things. All right, so um, this is quite interesting. Um, so these are lists of compatible offenses. Uh, well, we're not going to dive into each section, so we're just going to take some example. For example, uh, this one. If there's any major changes in the infrastructure and uh, uh, new systems, right, uh, the NCII operators shall notify the sector lead, right, uh, of any significant changes within 30 days. So there's a timeline being mentioned. So for those who are classified under NCII, again, these are your responsibility. You need to be uh, aware. You need to aware about these requirements. You need to be accountable. If any failure to comply, basically you are you are facing compatible offenses. You are you are breaking the law. So uh, also another one. Um, you need to inform. Uh, uh, this one is uh, a new system. 
It's a very interesting compatible offenses which I would like to highlight. Uh, okay, I think it's in another slide, but it's okay. We will move on to the other slide. Uh, we have actually have a case studies. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, regulation. The next regulation talks about the period for cybersecurity risk assessment and audit. Now, um, if you're coming from financial sector, I think this is nothing new to you. I think coming from financial sector, bank negara, security commissions, uh, the regulators have uh, already established a very well-defined uh, penetration testing, vulnerability assessment uh, period. And uh, for all the banking operators, this is not something new. Uh, however, for non-banking operators, like if you're coming from, from uh, let's say agriculture, coming from plantation industry, uh, probably this is going to change the way change the way how you perceive cybersecurity prevention, because risk assessment is a very critical part of cybersecurity prevention. You do not do risk assessment after an incident happened. You know, you do not do risk assessment after you have been attacked. You do risk assessment as a prevention measure. And uh, for many non um, IT savvy industries, right? IT uh, that is susceptible to um, to to a lot of high tech. Uh, protection and this could be something new. You know, if we talk about penetration testing on a on a on a plantation uh, operator. It could be something new to to some operators. So that's why uh, this is a new concept that many of the NCI operators may need to be aware of. Uh, you are required to carry out cybersecurity risk risk assessment once a year, at least once a year. Uh, but again, a side note here: today hackers do not hack you once a year. Hacker will not hack you every quarter as well. Hackers will hack you 24 by 7, 7 days a week. Uh, hackers today are using automated methods to carry out their, their cyber attacks. You know, the, they're using software that works 24 by 7, 7 days a week, non-stop. So as soon as a loophole being discovered, a vulnerability being discovered, that's where hackers, the, the software will notify the hackers and hackers will take over and then continue on the exploitation of, uh, of the loophole. So having a risk assessment done once a year, I think from a regulatory perspective, this is this is still okay. But realistically, whether a, an o NCI operator shall only confine itself to do it once a year, I would say is no, because uh, we are looking at the trend of cyber attacks, looking at the, um, the the threat intelligence that we have gathered over the dark web, it is very scary. Hackers today, they do not uh, need to, you know, they need to, do not need to sit in front of computers to hack. And most of the hacking process are currently being carried out by software already. So uh, even though the regulation says that we need to do security risk assessment once a year, but I would strongly encourage NCII to consider doing it more in a more regular manner and even make it a part of a culture for organizations to carry, carry out risk assessment as and when there are significant changes in the infrastructure. So this makes a lot of sense so that because every time when you make certain changes in the infrastructure, Structure, there's also a chances of introducing new risks to the environment. So, um, okay, back to the act. Uh, the operators, NCI operators, also required to carry out cybersecurity audit once every two years. Again, uh, the interesting part about this regulation is that um, how do you define how do you define security audits, and how do you define security risk assessment? And this is the interesting part because if you have a clear definition of about security risk assessment and uh, have a list of a checklist item, then it, it it will be very clear for the operators to follow. Again, uh, we have asked this question to some of the sector leads before, and then the the answers given is that the sector lead will come up with their own guidelines, a code of conduct, a code of practices, and then within a code of practices, they will highlight what are the required items to be assessed and further define. What do they mean by security risk assessment? And what do they mean by security audit? So this is something that we're also anticipating the, the sector leads to publish. And right now, for example, in the banking sector, we have um, we have studied the uh, RMIT, right? RMIT standard and then security commission also have the security guidelines. So I would foresee that other sectors may have something that interchangeably in similarity that define what do they mean by security risk assessment. So this is something that we hope to see uh, soon, so uh, so the operators have a much clearer I identification and understanding about what exactly does the sector lead means by security risk assessment. Um, okay, the next one is um, this is very interesting. Notification of security incident. Now, if you look at cybersecurity management, right, it's it's like a life cycle. When we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about prevention. We prevent first. We talk about management, maintaining of the security posture, and finally, we need to think of 
the inst the, the situation where we are compromised or we are under attack and how do we respond to those attacks. So this itself is a life cycle from prevention, management and to respond. It's an entire life it's a complete life cycle. And I'm also very glad to see that uh, uh Naxa has also considered this part as part of the uh, uh very important part of uh as part of the Cybersecurity Act that talks about notification of security incident. Now this is also a game changer. Uh, why? Because if you relate back to the example that I've given about healthcare sector, uh, previously, if the regulate there, there was no regulations that mandate disclosure, there was no regulation that says, oh, uh, when once you're under attack, you need to notify the authorities and you need to submit the incident re report to the authorities. There were no such requirements for some of the sectors, like even plantation, uh, trade industry. There's no such requirements. So when there's no such requirements, when incident incident did happen. Um, we may not see, we may not be notified, notified about such uh, cyber attacks. And when there's no report of cyber attacks, there will be no sharing of intelligence. When there's no sharing of intelligence, the entire the entire sector may also suffer the similar fate of cyber attacks, and no one talks about it. And we are not sharing intelligence. And for us to to for us to respond to the attack is the efficiency of that is going to be extremely low, uh, for because nobody's sharing intelligence. Um, and having said that, I think the financial industry in this matter is quite matured. I mean, the Bank of Nigeria is regulating the, uh, the dis disclosure requirements uh, for all the banks and the financial institutions like insurance agencies. So I think Bank of Nigeria has played a very pivotal role and a very vital role in this area about intelligence sharing. And hopefully the same experience can roll out to other industries like uh, transportation, for example. Uh, the ironic part about this also, I mean, um, again, this is on the paper. On the 26th of August, when the act is being enforced, then we see another transportation company, organizations was suffering a data, data leak attack on the same day. So, um, and now because of the act, uh, the requirements of the act, uh, such incident need to be disclosed, need to be reported. And when we talk about incident response, there are also a very clear requirements for reporting the incident, six hours reporting. Within the six hours, uh, you need to include, you need to report to the authorities, you need to report to your sector lead about what kind of incidents you are suffering, you know, what kind of cyber attack, the time of incident, and the basic uh, background about the incident. And uh, after the incident, within 14 days, you need to submit a report that include the details about the affected infrastructure, uh, who are the threat actors, possible threat actors, what are the tactics they're using, uh, and um, a at least a preliminary findings about the incident to the authorities within 14 days. Now, coming from a commercial standpoint, right, because we, we, are, we are also actively assisting organizations in computer crime investigation, digital forensic and incident response, I think six hours and some 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 of our peers may say six hours is okay, uh, you know, it's, it's quite lenient, but I think six hours is too lenient in my personal view. Because when an incident happens, right, every second of the incident is critical to the organizations. Every second of delay, every second of, uh, you know, uh, procrastination is going to cause uh, cause damages to the organizations, whether it's, whether it's financially or image, in terms of image or in something intangible, it's going to cause damages. So six hours, I think, is very, very lenient. In fact, if you look at it, right, with some of the industries that we're working with, when you when you uh, identify an incident, uh, within an hour, we we, we already trigger the incident response team, we already trigger the top management, we're already notifying the regulators, and also, uh, if necessary, notify the CERT, of the government to, to trigger everything. So I think six hours for me, I think is quite lenient, but understandably also because there are some NCI sectors, they may not be as, as aggressive and may not be as uh, matured as some of those other industries like the FSI, like the telco. So I think six hours is a good start, uh, but for any NCI operators, just to share with everybody, six hour is extremely lenient, extremely you know, uh, generous. Because if you are sitting in the board of a of a of an NCII, right, you wanted to be notified as soon as we discover the incident, as soon as the incident happened, you know, we have some preliminary information. You want to be notified, not six hours later. Uh, Fourteen days, I think, is also very generous because um, in our experience in handling national level of incident response, right. Uh, you do not need 14 days to come up with a report. At least the preliminary report that identified the threat actors, the TTP, 
threat techniques and uh, procedures and all this should be done you know within the first week and then following by that following on the containment you work on the recovery and i think 14 days again is, is very lenient but again we also need to consider those sectors who are not uh, who, who are not that mature versus those sectors who, are, who have been who have been uh, regulated for a long time so and uh, last part is the licensing of service providers. Uh, there are clearly right now there are two types of services uh, provider. Uh, service providers need to be uh, licensed. Number one is the penetration testing service provider. Number two will be the uh, SOC operators. Um, and um, so failure to to be to to be to apply a license. I mean, this we are also going to face a fine. Uh, and these are the, you know, for, for the licensing fee will be 400 for individuals and 1,000 for companies. Interestingly, today, 1st of October is also the first day where uh, the licensing application is open up to the Malaysian public. And uh, I'm not sure whether our team has, starting, uh, has started the application process, but uh, if anyone who would like to apply for license, today is the day where the licensing uh, application opens. So do, do check out Nexa, Nexa website. So um, again, my personal opinion about licensing scheme is, uh, is that I think overall it's good because now we will have a register of licensed, so-called licensed service providers. Uh, it established some kind of accountability for the providers. Uh, they, need to be, they need to be registered uh, and they, um, they, they, will up, they need to uphold certain accountability when they are registered. However, my concern on the other end is that uh, again, this is uh, solely my personal opinion. Whether the government has the resources to qualify licensed service providers or not, because I personally foresee that we will have we will have a surge of applications of service providers. Again, my speculation is that there will be many companies who will apply for license, whether or not they are providing penetration testing services or SOC services we will see a lot of applications of interest to apply for applications. My concern is that whether the government, the public sectors have the sufficient resources to qualify these applicants and also to, um, to, to uh, do a DOD and uh, qualification verification about this. Otherwise, if we just register anyone who applies, it really defeats the purpose of licensing. Um, because if anyone just apply, then they get their name listed on the register and become a licensed provider. It may even create a false impression to the public that, uh, you know, if I get someone who are registered with registered with the with the government, they are supposed to be good. You know, it may create a kind of false impression. So my concern is that whether the government uh, will have the sufficient resources to qualify uh, licensed service providers or not. I think this is. Uh, this is to be told. I mean, the, the facts to be told. Uh, we are we are very much anticipating on that. So power authorities. This one, um, <clears throat> to cut it short, I would say the act has granted uh, the chief executive a huge amount of power uh, to over to oversee the entire execution of the act. Uh, I don't want to go into details, but you will see this in the slide, and uh, and uh, we will we'll share the slide with with everybody after this as well. So what are the Impacts to individual. Okay, let's talk about it more in a more generic term. Um, impact, of course, there will be impacts because we are looking at something new. We are new to the country. We are looking at something as is going to be uh, adapted. Need to be adapted by many organizations. Uh, definitely, definitely, there will be impact. Now, whether the impact is positive or negative is all you know. It's back to your own perception. Uh, coming from individual perspective, I think as a as a general public, a normal person, I would welcome this act because it gives me certain comfort and confidence that now I know that some of the data uh, custodian of my data or some of my service provider now, they have to comply to, to an act. They need to protect my data. They need to protect the infrastructure so that my life is not going to be disrupted. Uh, I have the kind of comfort uh, in a way. And for companies, it is also like a wake-up call for those companies who have never been looking into cybersecurity seriously and or fortunate enough have not been enduring any form of cyber attack. Attacks, this is a good opportunity to kickstart your cybersecurity protection. Um, and re re in reality, right, many of these many of the organizations actually come to us for 
for incident response help for forensic investigation uh, only after they got hacked. I think the time when you got hacked and then seek for help, that time the cost is going to be very expensive. That's why this is this can be seen as a wake-up call for many organizations who have been looking around, want to get started about uh, uh, protecting their infrastructure. I think this is a good start. The framework gives you a very clear guideline and what what to do and uh, what to you know what to comply in terms of requirements is a good start for for many uh, companies uh, for investors perspective uh, because of the execution introduction of the law there will be um, demand for cybersecurity uh, services there will be demand for cybersecurity products and solutions so if you're coming from investment community you can start looking at uh, providers of software hardware or even services uh, this could be a, a, a good opportunity for investors um, with this with this, um, with the introduction of cybersecurity, I would foresee overall the sector growth will be stimulated. I mean, we will start to in encourage the maturity of many sectors. Previously, financial sector, uh, telecommunication, sec telecommunication sectors are heavily regulated. But now with other NCI, NCI sectors being mentioned, we foresee that because of this act, it's going to stimulate the cybersecurity maturity of the rest of the other sectors. Now, when this NCI national critical infrastructure sector get to be more matured, in essence, it basically helped to enhance the entire national cybersecurity. After all, they are called NCI national, you know, critical uh, uh, information infrastructure. So it, it's going to enhance the entire national cybersecurity. Uh, of course, business opportunity. Um, just going to go through this. Now we have also classified. We have also summarized uh, the compatible compatible offenses, uh, and then there, there are some example scenarios in the slides. Uh, which don't, I'm not going to go through this uh, because it's going to be very boring and scary. Uh, we're going to leave that to everybody to digest afterwards. Uh, but if you look at it right as an overall, we are looking at fines with six figures and not lesser than. Of uh, uh, jail term not lesser than two years, uh, which is quite serious. Um, and who are the ones who is going to be susceptible? You know, who is going to be uh, affected by this? Typically, management of the organization. Uh, it could be the chief executive officer. Uh, it could be the board members, the directors who will face this kind of penalties. So, tips for everyone who wish to put your boss to jail. Okay, try to explore these offenses. All right. Uh, let's before we continue, let's look at. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, let's let's see if we have any questions. Let's go through some of these questions. There are quite a number of questions. <laughs> so. Yeah, great. So Alex, maybe you can you can pick the questions. Uh. That's interesting. <laughs> now you're putting the ball to me. <laughs> okay, there are many questions. I guess to to look at it. So I think uh, one of the question is that uh, is an infrastructure construction and property development company classified as in the NCII industry? Yes, this is very interesting. We have also asked the same question. Uh, construction, property development, uh, is it classified under NCII? My personal view is that they should be classified under NCII. Um, but which sector they classify under i also have no idea i i do not know whether this is uh this is going to be classified under trade industry or uh i i have no idea about this same as uh retail and also hospitality um are they being missed out or are, are they going to be classified under under one of the 11 let's say let's go back to one of the 11 construction property if you look at it right uh, this is a good question. In fact, we have also have encountered this question before. If you look at this, right, construction, um, could it could it be uh, this one? <clears throat> Unlikely, but is it possible? I I don't know. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be waste management and energy. But could it be under here? Maybe not. Um, so this is also uh, this is something I I don't know. I mm. seriously I don't know. Uh, so in summary, is a, a construction or developer is still fall under the NCII industry. Like it's just that question is like which one, right? Um, my view is yes because uh construction 
property development should be classified under NCII. But under this act, you know, which one do they fall under? I don't have an answer. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I would like to go to the second question. I think some is asking is like, uh, especially when you were showing in terms of the, you know, the cyber security risk assessment and also the cyber security audit, right? So yeah. I think the important is that, is it referred to BAPT or is it going to be different? And and what is the difference? Uh? I guess uh, there are yeah. a couple of guys asking this kind of thing. Yeah, good question. This one, this one, the best person to give you the guideline will be the sector lead. Because as I mentioned before, right, if every sector will have a sector lead and will publish the code of practices. Within the code of practices, most likely you get a definition about risk assessment. What is, uh, what, what is required within the, 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 the boundaries of risk assessment. For example, you need to do a VAPT for your infrastructure, you need to do a web app assessment for all your web applications, you probably need to do mobile app testing, you need to do source code review, host configuration review, and, and, and such things. It's going to be very likely to be defined by your sector lead under your sector. Uh, so uh, that's why if you look at the regulations in general, they just say, say that you need to do it at least once a year. and what are the content? I think it's going to be likely to be defined by the sector leader. All right. But definitely, I think uh, VAPT is confirmed as part of the risk assessment already. Yeah. I, okay. I think also uh, they were asking about, I think you're, you're, you were also touching about the six hours and then after that, two weeks later, the more detailed information, right? So I think one of the questions they were asking uh, is also important for the audience to know is like, uh, is it a true positive information in terms of providing? In terms of what? Sorry, true positive uh, For example, the notification are within six hours upon confirming, right? Of the true positive incidents. I think this is one of the questions that audience Oh, whether it's a false positive or true positive, right? I, I think it's still subject to the subject to the organization is being affected. Um, I think the whole spirit of reporting is to report what you know. You may not, especially in the incident response, I have to share with you the, the, the realistic situation is this. Sometimes when we handle incident, right, we may see something that the hackers want us to see first. You know, we may not be able to dig down to the real root cause, even within the first few days, you know, during the, the root cause analysis, during the incident response. We may not get the absolute truth about the incident, even within the first few days or so. So we, we have to have the kind of expectation that uh, we may not get the real positive or false positive or whatever, even though we are start, you have started an incident response. Nevertheless, the spirit of this regulation, as how I perceive it is, report first. Report what you know first. At least there are some intelligence that is shared with the, the authorities. And if there are similar incidents happen within the same industries, we can do cro uh, this uh, uh, cross, cross confirmation with all this intelligence by the authorities. So I think the spirit of reporting is just report first, uh, without, um, even though you may not have a confirmation of the root cause, just report first. So and again, you may not be penalized because of yes, you're mm -hmm. submitting a false positive or maybe a, a, a true positive. Uh. So I guess also interrelated question for the next one. So some were asking is like whether the licensed uh, cybersecurity service provider, I believe is not obtained from LGMS, it's more from NAXA. Right? From no, it's not, like a, not coming from us. Confirm. Yeah, we are yeah. not a, so that's why I'm giving... answering on behalf of, <laughs> of, of you. Yeah. It is actually from NAXA. You have to acquire the license from NAXA, which is starting today, 1st of October. We are during uh, uh, Mr. Fong presentation earlier. I think the next question is more towards to like uh, for cybersecurity notification of cybersecurity incidents, right? Uh, are the details made public or only to the government and sector leads? Okay, this one, we there's no clear uh, publications that talks about the disclosure, terms and condition of disclosure. La. So mm. based on our experience looking at the FSI sector, you just report back to your sector lead and mm. whether or not the sector lead mandate you to disclose to the public, public due to perhaps public interest is entirely up to the sector lead. But what if, if you just interpret itself, interpret the act itself, is just say that you need to you need to report to your to the sector lead, uh, and it's entirely up to the sector lead. I would say. 
But if it's concerning public mm. safety, public interest, naturally, I would say that uh, the second lead will mandate you to disclose to the public. Lah. For mm. example, mm. let's say your, I don't know, I'm just using it as example. Let's say the LRT system is hacked. You know, uh, it's almost causing a fatality or uh, almost crash into almost crash into another rail or whatever. So this kind of incident, I would assume uh, the the second lead will want to have a disclosure to the public. Okay, so I think this is also a question from the, I would say from a service provider, right? So cybersecurity service provider, they could be part of the large, larger organization, for example, for a group like a big large uh, system integrator, right? For, uh, for example, for the li liability and also any infringement, right? Is it the head of the service provider, which is cybersecurity, or the head of the parent company will also help yeah. responsible? Yeah, this is a good question because some conglomerates, they do provide penetration testing and security operations center services. So the question is that under one company, you have different departments. Uh, when incident, when, when there's a dispute happen, who will be accountable? I think if you look at the licensing scheme, right, it's, it's licensing directly to a company. It's not to a department of a certain companies or not to a subsidiary of a certain company, unless the subsidiary is a, in, is a company by itself. Because if you look at the licensing scheme, there's only two categories. One is individual, another one is company only. So to answer this question, I think uh, if you are a conglomerate, it's licensed under you as a conglomerate. Um, and that's how I see it based on, the, based on what is being, being published in the regulations. Okay, thank you. So this is also an interesting question. Uh, they were asking is that how to define an attack incident that required to report to the authorities, right? How to define uh, an attack that required to uh, uh, to the authorities? The incident may be from a group of device or some identity hijack, etc. Yeah, and sometimes incident may not be intentional. This is something that need to be be defined very clearly. Sometimes incident can be due to unintentional misconfiguration. We have seen cases like that. Uh, a customer thought that they're under attack, under DOS attack, you know, but eventually it's just a misconfiguration of the firewall. And these kind of incidents do happen. Now, whether or not uh, any incidents or certain incidents need to be reported, I think the best person, the best party to answer that uh, will be your sector lead. Um, as a best practice, I would say, I mean, again, coming from working with the regulator industry for over two decades, right? The way how we see it is that any incident, doesn't matter what kind of magnitude, it shall be reported. At least if certain incident, even at the initial stage, may not uh, may not exhibit too much of an impact. But if you are reported the incident, it actually gives the regulator much better clarity. Uh, just in case the incident later evolved to be a much larger scale of a, uh, become a cyber attack. So I would say the best practice is report the incident. Of course, in-house, internally, you also should have a qualification process to qualify what is perceived or defined as an incident. So internally, you should have a, a guideline, a SOP, for people to have a better definition. And uh, in general, I would say you, you should report to authorities or uh, to your sector leads uh, for incidents, mm, okay. for even, you know. Uh, All right, good. Uh, there's definitely questions people who ask whether power waterworks are part of the NCII, even absolutely are, right because to that I thought I would answer on behalf of you as well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they also have a question talking about monthly lender provider. Is it classified as under NCII? This one I'm not certain. Yes, financial. <laughs> you see the way how I see it is this. Um, of course, when you want to roll out an act, right, it's not an overnight thing. You cannot do it overnight. It's almost impossible to do it overnight. Why do I say that? Because I've also done some study in other countries about the uh, Cybersecurity Act. Uh, did you know that Thailand has started this uh, similar Cybersecurity Act three years earlier than us? Three years. And they are wow. now still rolling out the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the enforcement to different various sectors. They also have a 11, 11 or 13 sectors, I can't remember. Uh, but also, they're also rolling out the act to different sectors and it takes time you know, for, for the act to cascade down to organizations of various sizes. You know, typically, we look at the, the, 
large organization first, organizations first, and the more critical organizations first. But eventually, mm-hmm. it's going to cascade down to smaller organizations and medium-sized organizations that's less critical, but eventually, it's going to cascade down all the way from top to uh, big to small. Mm-hmm. It takes time, all right? All right? Mm-hmm. And then back to this question, is money changer as part of the NCII? I would say yes, because you're classified under financial sector, but how soon is it going to cascade down to money changer industry? We also don't know. The entire exercise is going to be driven by the government and uh, looking at the current administration, looking at how fast they pass the, uh, the bill and, yeah. and uh, how fast they enforce the act, I think, I think they are very fast. La. So, so just get ready. La. Okay. So there is also this another interesting question. What is your opinion about Cybersecurity Act coordinating with other laws like the PDPA? and the CMA to address the overlapping issue of data protection, privacy, and cybersecurity? Yeah, this is a perfect question. It's an excellent question because data protection is very co- very much coexist with the Cybersecurity Act. Now, Cybersecurity Act mandates the protection and, uh, of critical information uh, infrastructure. Talk about infrastructure protection. If you look at data protection, data protection can be a subset of part of the infrastructure. Data lives on the infrastructure. So when we combine, when we combine everything together, right now we have a kind of a complete ecosystem of legal guidelines framework already. Because previously we we when we do not have this uh, cybersecurity act. Uh, we solely re, we solely depending on the regulators, sector regulators themselves to come up with their own regulations. Like Bank Negara come up with the IMRIT, uh, Telco have their own standard, MCMC have their own requirements. So now with this act in place, it's creating a blanket of protection for various industries in conjunction with the PDPA protection. And something worth mentioning about PDPA also, we are seeing now an updating bill uh, being tabled and uh, we foresee that uh, with the with the enhancement of the PDPA bill, then uh, our PDPA is going to be more complete, uh, which is which is very good. Uh, and also, since we are talking about this topic, right, there's also another law that was uh, that is often uh, not being mentioned, which is the 1997 Computer Crime Act. Malaysia is considered one of the earliest, you know, earliest country in Southeast Asia region have this Computer Crime Act. Uh, and uh, with now we have the Cybersecurity Act. 1997 Computer Crime Act with PDPA, I think we uh, consider uh, the ecosystem is getting more mature already, which is good. Okay, good. So I I, I, I also see that pe- people are also wondering and, and worrying, right? Whether their vertical will be classified as NCII entity, right? So yeah. they, 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 in their mind is like, uh, how do they find out and when would they be able to know specifically? Right, because you have shown that the, the verticals, uh, but if you are exactly, for example, if you are in the energy, you are definitely part for, of the NCII, right? Yeah, if you are in yeah. FSI, you cannot run away. But yes. sometimes, like you say just now, the construction or developers, right? Uh, it could be in a gray area, which vertical, but doesn't mean that they are not under the NCII. So, is there yeah. any other possible ways uh, that they are able to <clears throat> to get more clarity? I would say the first thing I would look at, right, to determine whether your sector, your industry is part of NCII is look at the ministry, the ministry that issue you governing uh, regulations. Let's say, for example, why I say the construction is, is a bit gray area is because if you look at this, look at this transportation. Highway Authority of Malaysia. I mean, for those constructing construction company who build highway, right, are they classified under transportation? Uh, I think if you look at it, it's, it's probably not that probably not belongs to transportation, but they are just construction company. But uh, that that that's why it's it's a bit interesting. So to determine whether your industry is part of NCI, I would say look at the ministry first. Look at the ministry that uh, is governing your business, uh, whether it relates to you. And then the second thing is, uh, of course, uh, we can always write to Naksa and, and inquire because ultimately Naksa is still the one who is uh, enforcing the uh, the. The, the execution of this act. So I think right to Naksa, nothing wrong with that. Okay, good, good, good answer as well. Well, there are so many interesting questions. So I am trying to pick up the interesting one. <laughs> so yeah, there's some of the question is related whether, uh, many of the questions are related whether the NCII, whether is it fall under that, right? 
Yeah, so yeah. and and I think you have actually given a, a pretty good answer to the uh, previous question. Uh, you can also check with NASA. You can also check with the license that is being given from the ministry. Uh, so I think there is this question, you know, they're talking about for incident reporting. Is there any information if this is centralized reporting or sector to lead to pick up or up to the sector lead to determine reporting mechanism in China? Okay, I think this question in in, in a generic way, I would say the sector lead will have the authorities. We have the first authorities. Of course, anything that do not deviate from the act, the sector lead will have the authorities to uh, to propose. Uh. Hmm. Okay. So there's also a question for that earlier discussion with NASA that's, you know, providers of cybersecurity awareness train, train I mean, so awareness tra training, uh, need to yeah. be licensed to is it still applicable or maybe in the later stage i uh i do not know the answer uh i'm also quite curious because so far what has been required to be licensed is soc and penetration testing providers only uh for education academy uh i don't see any regulations yeah. just yet but it's also good to check with AXA whether it's required or not so what about system integrator that offer VAPT or SOC as well? They also require to be licensed, right? Yes, yes. As long as you provide these two services, you need to be licensed. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think we still have time. Maybe we'll go through a few more questions. Is that okay, Mr. Fong? Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, uh, right. I only have a few more final slides, uh, the, the case okay. studies. Uh, but I think, I think answering questions is more important because these are more concerning to everyone's interest. Okay, the question is like uh, they meant, uh, one of the questions is like you mentioned the hospitality and construction and property developer are not part of the act, but you also mentioned that it may be included if we use the definition of the trade and that will be classified under. Like I, I, I mentioned, I share a good example just now, like for example, construction, right? Just now we look at trans under transportation industry, one of the sector lead is the... Uh, it's this one. It's a highway. Uh, well, let me just go back to here. Highway Authority of Malaysia, uh, which you know, for the construction of highways, I think somehow or one way or another, you may need to deal with these authorities. So, but then again, construction is not clearly defined as NCII. Uh, so that's why that's where the confusions, uh, there's an overlapping. Yeah. Is another interesting question, uh, because the. Uh, uh, a lot of people may be asking also, if I'm not NCII, but I provide solutions to NCII, will I be classified under NCII or not? Right. For example, if I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I provide healthcare equipments for hospitals, I manufacture healthcare equipments, I'm, I'm a manufacturer, I manufacture a very simple, let's say plastic syringe, you know, but I'm not coming from, I, I'm not coming from healthcare because I manufacture many other things. Uh, just plastic syringe is one of the things I, ma I manufacture. I also manufacture plastic bowls, you know. But am I classified under healthcare? And uh, do I need to comply to this Cybersecurity Act? Mm. Uh, you know, this is also another question that we are so trying to find out. So I yeah. would say the best best party to be able to give you a clear answer is again back to Naksa. Okay. Yeah. There is this question asking about. Just healthcare, but uh, I would like to expand uh, to add on to it, like even healthcare, even energy, even F, uh, F. Let's not put FSI first because FSI are definitely critical. Whether you're tier one, tier two, tier three bank, right? Uh, uh, even other those four under the eleven N NCII, right? Uh, including healthcare. So they they are definitely big size of healthcare, and they are definitely small hospital or even clinic, right? So. Yeah. Would they classify as part of the NCII as well? Absolutely, because even though you're small, right? You see, the classification do, do not base on size. It does not base on market cap. It does not base on your number of clients. It based on the nature of operation. Uh, if you're a hospital, you're a hospital, regardless whether you're a small hospital or big hospital. However, having said that, the enforcement part uh, coming from a sector lead, right? Who are they going to name first as part of the enforcement? Uh, operators, I think they will basically will prioritize based on size first. La. I think that this is the way how I see it because um, it makes a, more, a lot more sense you 
protect the larger critical one first and then slowly cascade down to less critical and less uh, uh, less substantial size so uh, i think this is going to be the way how these uh, regulations uh, this x is going to be cascaded down mm, okay so let's go to uh, the last three questions before you continue and end your slides uh, thank you so much i know there's a lot of questions coming with from the participants uh, really interesting topic uh, however, I believe uh, uh, time is limited, uh, so I will go with the last three questions, right? I think this is also definitely important, especially to the sea level, right? In the yes, event of a yes. repetitive uh, or major breach of the act, could the CEO or C-suite uh, executive responsible for cybersecurity be held personal liable but or potentially facing imprisonment? The short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is depends. Uh, based on the act, it make it, it makes it very clear that uh, the the chief uh, executive, the senior executive, are liable. Uh, then again, you also have a way to defend yourself by complying to what is being required. Like for example, you have been doing security assessment, you have been doing security audit, or security audit all this while complying to regulations. Uh, you also report to the incident, uh, to the authorities. Uh, having said that, everything has been done properly, but you still got hacked. Uh, and in this kind of situation, I think it also makes a lot of sense. Like you, there is a you have already a, a lot of good defenses uh, that mm -hmm. can uh, get you out from the trouble. However, on another contrary example, if you are the chief executive of a, of a NCI operator, let's say you are uh, again, this is not. In particular, let's say you are a transportation uh, company CEO and you have never paid attention whether the company has been carrying out any security defense uh, you, or maybe there's a gap in reporting. The staff would tell you that have been, they've been conducting security awareness, they've been conducting security penetration testing, but in reality, they're not doing it. Or uh, when the authorities want to come in and extract evidence and then you giving them some kind of a challenges, you basically obstructing them to carry out their duties, then of course you are liable. I mean, you are facing mm -hmm. direct mm -hmm. penalty. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so I think there are two questions are pretty much related. Uh, uh, it's related to those uh, uh, service provider that provide SOC or even assessment, right? Uh, the question is uh, probably I will combine try to combine both into one uh, right so so uh, even uh, cyber security assessment uh, so the question is uh, do they need to also apply for license first with NASA or even uh, the question related to that I used to provide the services to uh, the NCI but not now so do I also need to apply license uh, you know um Again, I'm not sure whether you need to apply license, but uh, if you look at the act, right, any service provider that provides services, uh, you should be apply. You should apply license. Yeah. Uh, but whether or not you are providing to NCII, uh, I I think that may not be a priority question. The priority mm -hmm. question is that if you are providing such service, you should be applying for license. Yeah. So. Because uh, uh, one day or the other, if you're doing this kind of consulting services, you also want to expand your business, right? Yeah. So eventually yeah. you will hit into NCII. So for a safeguard, it's better to, to apply. So even their questions is related to like uh, SOC or VAPT. For example, you get from overseas provider, right? Mm -hmm. uh, directly, right? So yeah. how do you comply with this? Okay, this is a good question. There are two situations that you do not need to have a licensed provider to provide you uh the the two kind of services the first one is if the operators if the license if sorry if the service providers who are providing penetration testing soc operators are not local you do not need to uh, ask them to get a license another one is if these providers are within your organizations let's say you you have a department they're providing pen test soc they do not need to be licensed to to provide the service to your own group okay yeah. So, this last question is actually from me here, Mr. Fong. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'm speaking on behalf of a provider because I'm a provider, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I offer certain services. Uh, may not be in Malaysia, but in other countries. But I, I, I guess he's talking about 
like license, right, in Malaysia for a provider to get the license, is it very stringent or, or do you have any at least clue uh, how, what are the steps or is it going to be complicated or is it going to be easy? Um, based on what we have read on NAXA website, because it's just open today, uh, it requires you the 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 basic information, like for example, your SSM records, uh, if you're registered as a company, if you're registered as an individual, your your background information. Again, my my view, again, this is purely my view, nothing to do with the company. My view is that I think the government may not have sufficient resources to qualify in depth. They may do qualification. Of course, they will do qualification. I'm, without any doubts, they will do qualifications. But I, mm. I kind of concern that they may not be able to do in-depth qualifications on the applications. I foresee, I mean, sorry to say that, I foresee that there will be many IT companies or maybe even companies who have, who have traditionally not providing penetration testing, not providing SOC, will go and, will go and apply. Uh, we will see a surge of application. And with this surge of application, I'm not sure whether the, the government have the uh, resources to, to qualify. La. So, um, I, again, this is just my view. La. I, my view is that I'm more concerned that people later and later stage telling everybody, telling the clients that, hey, I'm a licensed pen tester by the government and I must be good. That kind of a false impression because <laughs> the licensing scheme itself is not solely based on merit. It's not solely based on qualifications. Uh, and this will create a kind of false impression. I'm going to I'm going to share with everybody a real example why I do have such concern on licensing. Because if you look at certification pers perspective, right? Uh, a good example is LGMS. We are a PCI qualified security assessor, mm -hmm. approved scanning vendors. For it, for us to obtain the license to audit to issue uh, a certification, we have to go through hell process. Uh, you have to go through qualifications every year at an individual level, at a company level. We have to have an insurance, cyber insurance, insurance coverage. We need to demonstrate um, uh, these uh, professions, proficiencies. We will be audited by the PCI Council. We need to submit our report for audit purposes. There's a whole lot of things they need to prepare in order to maintain the license. And, and this is how we compare with licensing scheme issued by the government. Do, does the government have the kind of resources to go through a merit-based, qualification-based licensing or not? If not, my next concern is that there will be there will be a lot of licensed providers that may not entirely providing the services that they, you know, that what we're expecting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Fong. Maybe Thank do you. you want to carry out on your last few slides? Yeah, just last few slides. Uh, basically, we have shared a few case studies. Uh, this one is coming from a transportation company. If you are coming from this sector, what should you be doing? So you're looking at preparation, prepare yourself first. Uh, how do you prepare yourself? Perform risk assessment, performing audit. And then we also, you should also start looking at maintaining it. Once you have prepared yourself, you know, know what, are your, what are your weaknesses, you apply security, uh, security countermeasures, you follow best practices, follow ISO standard, and finally, look at this part. This is a part that often overlooked. Uh, this is the part that we talk about incident response. Incident response where we, you know, you need to have the policies and procedures in-house to tell your, you know, your, your employees how to react to cybersecurity related incident. And particularly if you're part of NCII, how to work with authorities. Because there's one of the compoundable offenses that talks about failure to assist, to allow the authorities carry out the investigation. Meaning that if there's a cybersecurity incident happen, your sector lead may have the authorities or even at NAXA level have the authorities to come into your premise to secure evidence. And in the process of securing the evidence, if there's any obstruction of the, of the officers in carrying out their duties, you will, be compound, you will face their, you are basically breaking the law. You are basically uh, committing offenses and you're liable. So uh, these are the things that you start, need to start considering, uh, considering. So where do we start? Start by looking at our current policies, procedures, looking at whether we have sufficient documentations and guidelines in-house or not. Uh, again, we have also prepared a, a simple checklist, a simple questionnaire for everybody who attend this webinar. At the end of this webinar, I'm going to share with you a link. You follow this link. Basically, we're going to give you a very simple survey. Just go through a simple survey. We will tell you how close or how far are you when you talk about 
uh, the Cybersecurity Act compliance. So stay tuned. Uh, we are preparing the link. So after this, we will share with you the link. So go through the uh, assessment. Uh, and with the assessment, basically we tell you how, how close or how far are you from the Cybersecurity Act. So just keep it simple. If you are part of NCI, just look at these three things. Prevention. You know, you have to have policies, procedures, documentations that talk about prevention so that we can start following. Managing of uh, management of uh, security posture and finally, uh, and this is part is often overlooked, often um, uh, not being paid attention to, uh, which is uh, incident response. Uh, just a little bit of commercial, LGMS is very active in these three areas. If anyone requires any services, please get in touch with us. Uh, we will be able to help you to get started at least to do an assessment, in-depth assessment to tell you where are your gaps and how to get started. So these are the things that we're doing. Uh, we have another case study that talks about healthcare hospital. You know, uh, again, the same thing, same three principles applies. Look at your prevention mechanism right now, policies and procedures, what do you have? Uh, and also management mm -hmm. of cybersecurity, finally, response. Opportunities. I see some questions talking about the opportunities for um, of the entire industry. Now, I would say coming from the demand perspective, there will be demand for cybersecurity services, solutions, product. In fact, uh, speaking from on behalf of uh, the company, we do see inquiries coming in, coming from non-traditional sectors. That means non-regulated sectors. We start to see the trend is, is growing. Uh, we're starting to see more inquiries coming in to co the concern uh, about their, their compliance about the law. We're also getting inquiries from chief executive uh, officers. Uh, they, there is demand uh, growing. And also, uh, the opportunity also lies in training and education, uh, because when the the enforcement of the act is being imposed, uh, a lot more organizations will need security awareness, security awareness training, uh, of course, licensing opportunity for service security providers. Um, it will also stimulate security innovation, uh, solution innovation. Uh, this is uh, also a, a good thing to, to see that we get to see more product, security products and solutions come out to help the the uh, uh, to help the, the nation to comply with the security services. Um, so yes, that's pretty much of our presentation. But like I said, I would like to share with everyone a link uh, to go to 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 do the uh, the security assessment about the compliance of the law. So if you are interested to know how compliant and, and non-compliant you are against the Cybersecurity Act, we have a, a tool being built on our website. Uh, Ken, can you share that link? Yes, Mr. Fong. I have also shown the, the QR on our screen. So if there is anyone is interested to find out, please feel free to, to scan the QR. We will share the link shortly in the chat. Also, uh, you share the link in the chat. Uh, yes, just type the link in the chat so everyone can see yeah. and click on the link. Yeah, sure. Okay, I finally find a way to open up the Q and A box. Uh, just start with the latest one. Uh, is cyber cyber insurance is part of the requirement for the licensing? No, uh, it's not been mentioned. Uh, cyber insurance is not being mentioned as part of the licensing scheme. Or oh, Alex, maybe you can pick and choose because I'm just starting to. Look yeah, this yeah. so uh, you have answered that uh, answer line there. So I guess um uh, I think the question is like uh, organization that can do risk assessment and pen tests are uh, to comply the act or to internally. I think uh, this is one of the questions. Okay. Organization can do the. Means that I think if if those company can can do risk assessment and pen test right, uh, to comply, I uh, I'm not quite understand on the question. Is it for internal or for external? Sorry, which which question? Which question is that? Uh, uh just after. Uh, I think the just now you were. I think the any possible way for LGMS to involve in giving out license. To service provider. I, okay, I we are not licensing already, provider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they have also but, developed the, the the link or certain tools for you guys to see where you are, whether you comply, which is actually in this slide the uh, QR code that you can. And I think the next one is uh, is cyber uh, insurance you already mentioned. I think is also uh uh there's this Dylan Gore. 
after the if is cyber insurance part of the requirement for the licensing no, dealer? No, it is not. No, it that one not. you already answer. I think on top of it, there is one question from Dylan Go. Means organization can do the risk assessment and time test. Um, which one? Uh? On top of the cyber insurance. The previous question from uh, cyber insurance. These organizations can do risk assessment and pen test to comply the act to internally. Okay. If you, it, Dylan, this is to answer your question. If your service provider, your pen test provider, and SOC belongs to your own organizations, they do not need to be licensed. If your own organization own them, like they could be a department, they could be a, a, a subsidiary, they do not need to be licensed. Hmm. If the customer company is overseas, right, providing cybersecurity solutions, uh, do they also confirm? They do, uh, I mean, the question is like, uh, or they are just trying to confirm that they do not need to get the license from NASA, right? Okay, this is based on my interpretation about what we have read uh, on the regulations. Uh, if you're not a Malaysian business entity, you don't need to get a license. All right. So is ISO 27001 cover this act or not? We are talking about a different thing. ISO 27 talks about protection of information yeah. asset. Uh, the act talks about more things about this. So mm -hmm. you can use it as a foundation to get yourself started uh, to draft out policies, mm. procedures, uh, but of course the act covers more. Mm. So prior to Cybersecurity Act 2024, right, there was a separate license for penetration testing called PTSP. Is that still required still since uh, since there is a new license which cover penetration testing as well? Okay, as far as I understand, this is not a licensing scheme. Yeah. It was created by Cybersecurity Malaysia. Uh, and uh, this is not a licensing scheme. Right? It's just, yeah. It's just yeah. yeah, it's different. Now, whatever it is, the act, the act itself takes precedence, means mm -hmm. the act comes first. I think, you know what, I've been paying attention because your presentation is so interesting, uh, Fong. So I can uh, actually <laughs> answer this question as well. Is <laughs> the cybersecurity <laughs> awareness to employees a mandatory exercise to be conducted by organization? My question should be yes. Uh, because in your use case, you did mention the cybersecurity awareness, right? Yes, yes. Cybersecurity awareness is part of prevention. Uh, it's yeah. also mentioned in the act, in the act uh, by the way, the awareness. Mm -hmm. uh. So is the NCII entities appointed by NCII lead, those sectors not appointed by NCII leads, is that mean no need to comply I act? think for now, for now, yes, lah. I mean, if you're not, if you do not fall under the the NCII, and then you have no sector lead to issue a directives to follow, then good news, you are not part of the compliance requirement. Okay, so this is also an interesting question. If the sector is not part of the NCII entities or industry, right? Do, do the sector need to comply with the act, such as report incidents, risk assessment, security audit, and etc.? The short answer is no, you do not need to report because who do you report to? You may choose to report to NAXA. I think there's nothing wrong to report to NAXA. Or if you see something that relates to telecommunications, you report to MCMC, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of legal requirements, you may not have the mm -hmm. need legal need to report. Uh, in contrary, if you part of NCII, by law, you have to report. I think for safeguard, it's better that uh, the user should, I think, reconfirm with NASA whether they fall under the NCII. Yes, yes best to reconfirm. Or, right? Yes. The, the first, first thing I would suggest for organizations coming from construction, check with NASA, see whether you fall under the NCII or not. And if you fall under NCII, which part of NCII that you fall under? Just now I saw a question is coming from a very, very interesting question. I am a cloud service provider. I provide cloud services. Am I part of NCII? I mean, my short understanding and answer is yes, you're part of NCII because in uh, digital is part of information. Digital is part of NCII industry. So if you're a service, cloud service provider, you should be part of NCII already. Good. 
So is data center classified as NCII? I would say yes. This is information, digital, is part of NCI, but whether or not how soon you will be named by the sector lead, and that depends on if the sector lead will never name you, uh, then <laughs> whether you comply or not, then I think the best is check with Naksa or the sector lead. La. Okay, uh, there, there are still many questions. Maybe I'll just jump now because we are a couple more, and then we will just go into uh, the ending, la, right? Does the cybersecurity risk assessment? I think this one I covered earlier on. Uh, uh, this one I also covered earlier on. So yeah. this one uh, I also cover earlier on. So uh, I guess is uh, the last question I will have is like, uh, based on the question here. Is that uh, okay? Oh yeah, we have from Wun Tai Hai. Oh, like, Mr. Wood. Do, do, <laughs> do you think <laughs> not sure whether it's in KL or not? The BNN RMIT will be revised with this new act. I think if you, yes, you may yeah. What expect? Okay. I think the regulations will need to be aligned with the act. Because eventually, right, the act always comes first. And if there's any contradiction in between both, the act will take precedence. Meaning that if there's any uh, requirements mentioned by the Act and also there are requirements mentioned by, let's say, the RMIT and the RMIT has a lesser or less uh, less demanding requirements, the Act will take precedence. The Act mm. will be the prime uh, target to follow. Uh, I would I would expect RMIT will be enhanced to further co-align with the Act. This is something I'm, and I'm kind of anticipating. It will mm. be re revised uh, to... To be aligned with the act. But looking at it, right, RMIT itself is quite matured already, quite matured because it defines the regulated uh, the regular period, uh, regularity of how often you know organizations conduct penetration testing, VA and all that. I think it's quite matured. But uh with the act, I, I foresee there will be some enhancement, but I wouldn't say it's a major enhancement. Neither. Okay. Okay. So all right. This last one actually have three questions. <laughs> this wow. <la> these <laughs> questions have three questions in it. Number one, if company is overseas, no need license to practice. That is a question. But supporting Malaysia company being ICT, I think the question is more like if you are actually having local entity, then you have to have the license, right? No, no, no. If you are if you are having a local entity that receives the service. When you're a receiver of the service, you don't obviously you don't need to license. But if you are the provider of the service, yeah, you need to be licensed if you're local. Yeah. If you're the provider of the service but you're not local, um, you don't need to be licensed. However, however, there's a caveat here. I also have seen um um and see someone, some government government officials giving an answer is that if you are an international entity, you wish to provide services to a local entity, mm. you need to have a business entity here to be licensed. Yeah. Meaning that your representative, business representative here need to be licensed. Yeah. And and that itself gives me a, some kind of confusion also because what do you mean by representative? Does, does it mean that a subsidiary of this service provider or maybe the service provider need to register a new entity here to be licensed or how? Um, I am not sure. This, that's I, why... I guess, uh, yeah, I, I guess, for example, I, I mean, these days, a lot of people going into the subscription models, right? A typical example, like Hacker One is one of the... The, the, the VAT as well, right? Yeah. About Bounty, right? One Tree, right? Uh, yeah. But they don't have an entity over here and their, their route to market is actually through any system integrator. Line. For example, the system yeah. integrator is actually reselling their solutions to one of the NCII. And I think the system integrator have to be licensed, This right? case, yes. Yeah, we we'll say yes. Yeah, it makes sense to license. You see, end well, of the day, a licensing scheme, what do we, why do we want to have a licensing scheme? We want to establish accountability, right? We want to establish accountability for, for whoever who is selling these services. So uh, in that case, yes, the SI needs to be licensed. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you so much, Mr. Fong, and thank you thank to you. everyone attending this uh, webinar.
Thank you, everyone. And uh, again, we have shared the link if you're interested to take the survey about the assessment about your companies against the Cybersecurity Act. There's a free survey we have developed on the website. Just go to lgms.global slash follow. And with the lgms.global slash follow, you get to also subscribe to our channel for free. Uh, we on and off, we'll publish latest cybersecurity industry information in our channel, in WhatsApp and Telegram. Uh, and um, yeah, feel free to feel free to explore. Uh, just check our website. Thank you, anonymous Thank attendee. You, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Well. bye. Good night. Good night.